Okay, everybody. So um, this is apparently Jay's studio talk, in which Jay, that's me, I'm the uh, founder and lead designer of Wraith Games, a development studio in Hamilton, Ohio. We've been doing our bag for uh, about 12 years now, um, professionally, for a good chunk of that. And so this talk right here, this is all about not only starting your business in the independence games industry, but also what to sort of expect within your first few years of going professional. So, first question to all of you. How many of you have had to make a business plan before? For anything, not, not just game stuff, business plan. Oh wow, that's, that's actually surprising. We, uh, the first crowd that came in here, uh, about half the hands were like, yeah, and I said, okay, now for games. And then like all of them put their hands down. Okay, so we're gonna go over some of the brief fundamentals of creating a business plan. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to want to take your hobby, your, your real passion for what you do, and turn it into a career, you're going to have to get some outside funds. And one of the best ways to do that is creating a good business plan. So how many of you have created like smaller games that you've, cool, cool. Um, how many are you planning to create like smaller games here going forward? Nice, nice. So the thing is that one of the, one of the things that you really need to do is establish kind of a nice little portfolio of things. Um, that could just be for a game jam, like small little competitions. It doesn't have to be anything huge, but you have to establish that you know what you're doing within game design. And that's, that's makes sense, right? You know, no one's going to expect you to be able to open a bakery if you've never been able to make a croissant, you know? No one's going to be able to expect you to bowling alley if you know nothing about bowling, you know? How are you going to get funds when you can't prove that you have knowledge in that field? You can't. And it would be crazy for someone to say, like, okay, here's a million dollars, go make a bowling alley. And you're like, oh, I don't like football. It just doesn't work. So create a bit of a portfolio. Experiment around with things. Now, you're going to have many, many failures the first time you're trying to get an actual commercial game out. No one's expecting you to have a huge hit when you're, when you're starting out, especially since if you have a huge hit, why are you going to the bank for funds in the first place? That wouldn't make any sense. You'd be like, oh, no, I cut a million dollars. I'm just going to go spend that. Hey, nice. Come on in. Have a seat. Talking about game businessy stuffs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the thing is that once you have this kind of portfolio established, um, you're going to want to actually start getting down to the nitty gritty of an actual business plan. Now, one of the first things that they're going to want is an assessment of your projections financially. You have to say, this is the amount of money that I have put into this studio so far. That would include things like your computer, that would include things like programs you've bought, dev kits that you utilize, any sort of event that you've gone to and showcased your work. That shows the bank, like, hey, this person's really serious. They've already thrown, you know, maybe it's just a couple thousand dollars into this project. Well, the cool thing about that is that they're like, this seriousness can mean, it won't necessarily like completely translate over to it, but it can mean that you're going to be able to have what it takes to actually see this into the next steps of development in your business. So it's like, okay, cool. You have this huge list of things that you've, you've already spent on. Now you have to estimate the rest of your startup costs. You have to really look at the nitty gritty of what you need to not just have your business start, but actually get it into the next stages of development. So, okay, cool. Maybe your business is going to be primarily focused on VR. Well, maybe you need that Unity license. Maybe you need to actually invest in a dev kit or two, like for VR. Uh, maybe you need some mocap software, something like that. And you need to say, okay, this is the sort of median price for all that stuff. Cool. Have a list. <coughs> this is your startup costs. Great. Wonderful. What's next? you need to worry about your six-month projection. Now, the six-month projection is fairly realistic. Most of us, I think, kind of know where we're going to be in six months. You know, we know, like, okay, I need to make this first game. So you say, okay, I think I can make this first game in three months. No, 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 no. I think when we've all tried making a game, it's like, okay, no, it'll take, it'll take three months. 
And then three months after that, you're like, eh, yeah, this is just another half year. It'll be fine. At the end of that year, it's like, ah, oh, maybe I should call my mom. Maybe she can give me a little extra money because uh, I'm not going back to McDonald's. I'm going to keep this dream actually going. So the thing is that you have to be realistic. You have to set realistic goals and expectations for your first projects. The cool thing about this is the bank is not going to expect you to break even on your first half year, not even your first year in the most, in the most case. They're saying, okay, fine. We know that making a business like this is a struggle and we wouldn't be giving you money if it, making money was that simple because it never is. So you have to say, this is what I need going forward. Maybe you need a space. Maybe you need a place where you and your team can go and actually work. Maybe you actually need those funds to be able to work full time or get your employees to work full time. You have to put that in your business plan. <coughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. The bank knows I have to feed my people or my people cannot work for me. The bank knows I need this space, otherwise I can't operate my business. And then the bank knows, okay, fine, three months, six months, 12 months. It's not, the game's not gonna be out. But you can start showing benchmarks. On top of that, you really have to start working on your, working on your advertising the second you start a project. You cannot wait to do advertising when the game is finished. You can't even wait to do advertising when the game's halfway finished because you have to build that hype train for things. And advertising isn't always, always free. Advertising isn't always cheap. You have to go out to these events and you have to have playable demos, maybe a nice tablecloth with your logo, some business cards, some buttons, some stickers. Maybe you have to actually pay for Buffer, which allows you to post social media stuff more often. Because in today's marketing, social media is where you're gonna get your biggest crowd. That and obviously these events. Well, what about banner ads? Well, unfortunately, banner ads don't seem to work too well when it comes to the indie game market. I mean, you've seen like Clash of Clans, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's only because they have literally thrown millions of dollars at advertising. When you only have a couple hundred dollars for banner ads, not gonna work. Sometimes maybe like a targeted Facebook ad, targeted in your area, like, here's $20, show it to 3,000 people near me. That's something a little different, but you have to put this in your marketing budget. And you have to seriously start thinking about marketing from the beginning. Otherwise, you're not running a business, you're just running a really expensive clubhouse. You're running like, oh cool, we make games, but nothing will ever sell. Okay, cool, you got that, wonderful. What's after that, what's after your six months? Got a full year projection. Now your full year projection, thing is, do you really know where you're gonna be in a year? You know, like really, especially when you're starting a business, especially when all these hiccups can be going on. Sometimes when you work on your full year, it just seems so out there. Luckily, the banks tend to know that. They tend to know that a lot of this is kind of the greater guesswork of things. Cool, not a big deal. You're not lying, you're using projections. How do you use projections? Well, you have to look at other studios. A great industry sort of resource, I guess, would be Gama Sutra. It's an industry publication. It's from the people who actually do the, um, the game developer conference every year. They also uh, used to do game developer magazine as well. And so they had tons upon tons upon tons of articles of just developers talking about how their studio succeeded, how their studio failed, their benchmarks and all these things. You have all of these metrics that you can look on and you can say, okay, maybe their path is like this, I mean, my path is like this. I mean, this your path is like this. But you can still sort of say, okay, we can, we can kind of extrapolate where we might be in a year based off of these other similar companies. Neat. That's what banks love. And banks love it when you show that data, cite those sources, say, this was in this industry publication. On top of Gama Sutra, P Pixel Prospector is also a great resource for this sort of thing. Um, even um, the TIG forums, like you go onto the, the indie game forums, talk to people on there and be like, okay, where, where were you in this point? It's wonderful, it's wonderful, wonderful resources. Okay, cool, you have that, you have, okay, I'm going to increase the amount of events I go to, because they're always wanting growth. I'm going to increase the amount of events I'm going to, I'm gonna increase the amount of advertising I put in. I'm gonna increase the amount of manpower that I'm using to put into these games. 
That's your first year. Not too bad. What's next? Two year. They want a two year projection. Went from six months to a year to two years. Two years. That's if the first is like, ah, oh, kind of weird, nebulous fantasy land. Two years is like living on Mars. Yep, got to plan this trip to Mars. Okay, cool, thanks. So, everything's growth. Now, at two years, they're probably going to want you to hire a couple more employees. If you're not hiring some more employees, they're just going to be like, okay, three of you in this space. There's no growth here. They're going to want to see that you're making the kind of money, projected to make the kind of money, that shows that you can hire more employees, that shows that you can go to more events. Maybe increase the production of games. After the first year, first game releases. Then you have to do maybe two more. You can't just stagnate. You can't just stay at one. Because any company that has growth, they know that they're not going to make a return on their investment. And they're not going to support it. Cool. So second verse, same as the first, just ramped up. What about your third year? If your second year was like trying to like colonize Mars, this is like trying to colonize Narnia. It is that much removed from anything that you could possibly be even expected to receive. How is anyone supposed to expect two years out from their business? Well, you have your growth pattern, you have your metrics. You have to do that. And you have to show that you're willing to establish even more growth. But you have to do it in a realistic way because here's the kicker. Not only are you expected to kind of understand the growth of your industry, crazy, but you're expected to actually follow that growth or all of a sudden they might be, well, we don't really want to fund you anymore. Sorry. So you're expected to actually kind of follow that pattern to the best of your ability, but they're pretty lenient about that sort of thing. Now, luckily, after, after that, they don't want anything beyond three years. They're just like, no, three years is fine. We don't, we don't want like actual fantasy beyond this because we know you're stretching your understanding of how your business could work at three years. It's fine. What else do they need? Well, they need you to understand your platform. Fortunately, say you're releasing a Nintendo game. Nintendo releases their demographic information, so uh, the sex, age, uh, the play times and everything of the different player demographics. So you can say, I know who my market is. My market on the Xbox One is males. Uh, well, it's 58% of them are males, and they are primarily from the ages of 17 to 43, and they primarily play uh, 63, hours, uh, 63 hours a week or something to that extent. It's probably wrong, but it's whatever. Probably not even. I don't know. How many, how many hours in a week? Anyone know? Anyone actually know off the top of their head? Good, because I'm not alone. So the thing is that all of these platforms tend to offer this. So if you're doing mobile, the great thing about mobile is every single month, Apple re re releases these reports. Every single month, Android releases these reports. 68? 168. 168, I hate you. So, <laughs> so Apple releases these reports and Android's release, release these reports. And you have, well, Google. No talking, back class, mmm, wag finger. <laughs> so the thing is that these are, these are real raw metrics. You're like, these, you can even pinpoint it down to the genre. Now, Steam, Nintendo, Microsoft for Xbox, Sony, they don't really do that. Their numbers are mysteriously clean numbers with nice round zeros at the end. Yeah, it doesn't really represent the real world. And they only tend to do quarterly or annual reports. But you can still use that. You can still use that demographic data. You can still use that monetary data, things like that. Then you have to do what's called a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis is a wonderful, wonderful thing where you have to talk about your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. So with your strengths, Everything that is internal, everything that is, that is empowering you internally, what are you good at? Do you have a really good artist? Do you have a passion? Do you have an understanding of the industry itself? Do you have industry veterans working with you? What are your strengths as a team? What are your strengths as a company? What are your weaknesses? You have to be honest here. You don't want to go like too crazy being like, well, I have crippling depression. I don't always get to work every single day. You don't tell them stuff like that, but you're like, okay, well, we know that our programmer isn't exactly you know, the best, 
but how are we going to tackle that? For every weakness you give, you talk about how you're going to tackle it. Like, okay, we're going to bring them down here to EKU, and we're going to make them take that Unity, um, Unity developer certification so we know we can trust them. Like he'll, if he passes that test, we'll keep him on board. Okay, what are your opportunities? These are the things that are external, your opportunities and your threats. These are things in the market. Some good opportunities, especially down here, you got Run Jump Dev. You got Louisville Makes Games. You know, you have the people here at EKU who can help. You have Let's Play. You know, you have all this wonderful, wonderful stuff that can help you here. Even if you're not here. Like, you go up to Cincinnati, you have the, uh, the Cincinnati Game Developers Association. If you go up in Cleveland, you have the Ohio Game Developers Association. You have GDEX. You have all these wonderful opportunities. You put those in. You talk about the platform. You talk about how Nintendo is an open platform because you can't expect these bankers to know every little thing about games. You have to, you have to feed them a little bit. You're like, okay, Nintendo has become an open platform recently and anyone can submit these, these games. By the way, I remember when Nintendo was a closed platform and they vetted us for six months and now all of a sudden they're open. Eh, that's great. But at least the dev kits are cheaper. So the thing is that the threats are the inverse of that. What are external problems? Do you live in an area where there are a lot of other developers? Do you live in an area with, uh, with poor internet connection? Do you live in a place where it's going to be difficult for you to just get funding from additional sources? Because the bank doesn't just want you getting money from the bank. They want you doing other stuff as well. What are these threats that your company faces? You then also have to talk about your structure. How's your company structured? Are you an LLC? Are you an S Corp? Are you a C Corp? Are you a sole proprietorship? Don't be a sole proprietorship. No. Bad. Slap you on the wrist. I will come to your home and slap you on the wrist. How's your board? Do you have a board? Do you have just solidary leadership? Are you a flat management structure? What are, what are you? What is your company? What are your people? What are their skills? What are their degrees? Do they have degrees? If they don't have degrees, do they have certifications? Who are you? Because this raw data means nothing if they don't get to know you personally. Who do you want to be? Luckily, just like these Nintendo metrics over here, just like the, the things you can get to say, okay, well, we know that a lot of women play Nintendo and they play it for 30 hours a week and it tends to make $25,000 a year for them. That's great. Who do you want to be? Look at other companies. When we did our business plan, this was really cool, we looked at the behemoth, we looked at uh, Yacht Club Games, and we looked at um, uh, Tim Schafer's company. Anyone? Double Fine. Double Fine. We looked at Double Fine because they were all like, okay, Double Fine has 12 employees and they've been around for a little longer than us. Okay. Identify their strengths. Identify their weaknesses. Identify their threats and their opportunities. I didn't show people how many employees do they have? How long have they been in the industry? How much money have they made? What are their biggest titles? What are they doing? Don't look at Mojang. They are lightning in a bottle. Don't look at Rovio. Don't look at the Flappy Bird guy. These are outliers. Also, don't look at your cousin Mickey, who makes, base, or who makes games in his garage and has made $25 off of Flash revenue once in the 1990s. Don't look at him either. Remove the outliers from the equation. Look at like actual companies that you can model their growth. Behemoth may be a little big. It's fine. Double Fine may be a little big. It's cool. Yacht Club. Wave 4. Retro Studios. Whatever. But the banks want to see that you're serious. The banks want to see that you're able to say, we want to be these guys. We want to be these professional companies. Show them that. Don't falter. You, know, you grab it all up. You bind it like a nice prestige binding some great graphics, get it professionally printed, get some actual graphics on it. You know, if, you, if you're not too good with graphics, go get someone who has InDesign and just be like, I will give you $40, please help me. It's cool, it's cool, you know, because when you have a, a good, solid business plan, if you go out to events, take pictures at the events. If you have a studio space, take pictures of the studio space. If you have shots of your games, take shots of your games. A nice picture of your team just standing there, nice stuff. You know, even an iPhone, like the iPhone 6 was actually used to record a movie. I think it's good enough for your business plan stuff. But it has to look nice. Dress nice, put it in there, be fine. Presented to the banks. 
they may shut you down. Maybe you want to go to a credit union instead. Credit unions are wonderful. They'll give you less money. That's fine. But they're more willing to work with small, unproven businesses. And one of the most terrifying things you can tell a banker is, I'm making a video game company. Because they have no clue what that means. And the first thing they think of is, toys. Oh, you make, you make toys. Is that something you can make money on? What happened to Kenner? Remember Kenner? They, whew, they died hard, didn't they? And they had all that Star Wars money. I don't think we're going to see you today. The red stamp on the thing. But a credit union's more, more flexible. Problem with that is, unfortunately, that they have less money to give. And they might even understand games less. Because the difference between a bank and a credit union is that a credit union specifically is a coalition of lenders who are members of the credit union. You buy into the credit union. You put $5 in your savings account, you're a member of the credit union, you get to be part of their board. Big board. Yeah, that means it's people just like your grandma or your uncle or your <laughs> anyone, your school teacher. They may not necessarily know anything about games, even less so than the big banking investment people. So just be careful. You know, At least start with a bank. Worst thing to do is say no. Maybe go down to a different bank. Maybe try different tactics. That's cool. That's fine. You can have failure. If you're at this point, you've already made tons of prototypes that have failed anyway. Tons of stuff that hasn't made you any money. Learn from your failures. Read people. Make good decisions. That's what you have to do. Now, what about those angel investors I keep hearing about? The magical unicorns up on the hill who will come down and rain money on you for free. Well, a uh, little, little problems with that. Uh, first off, they exist. They are real. Unlike unicorns, sorry to burst any of your bubbles with that. Um, the, problem, <laughs> the problem with that is, though, that unfortunately, a lot of them aren't really interested in investing in games. To them, games are a kind of unproven market. And one of the things that, that angel investors really, really hate is development and manufacturing of goods and being distributed through another platform. They would, they would rather have something a little more... I don't know, like a web platform, your own proprietary web platform, that sort of thing. Thing number two is they want equity. Who here knows what equity is? That is, okay, you, okay, cool. That's hilarious because in the last group, everyone but one person raised their hand. So this is actually great. I get to actually explain what equity is. Equity is a stake in your company. You want to relinquish some sort of control over your comp company? That's equity. They, they want 40%. Fine, give them 40%. That means they get to make creative control. Or, well, creative decisions. They don't have complete control. Don't give them complete control, otherwise you shouldn't be in the business in the first place. If that's something you're comfortable with, and it's for a big enough price tag, that's fine. One of the advantages of angel investors is they have tons of people that they have worked with in the past. They have these networks. They didn't get rich enough to throw money at some random schlubs just standing there. They have connections. But they might also take the company in a place that you don't necessarily want to go. It really depends on whether or not that's something you're willing to take the risk with. So that's your business plan. Wonderful, amazing little business plan. Where do you go from there? Well, you an LLC? Please become an LLC. Please. You know, I'm not, I'm not the best to give like some financial legal advice. Please become an LLC. An LLC allows you to remove some liability from yourself. It allows you to create a buffer between you and any mistakes you happen to make, any tax mistakes, any money mistakes, any insurance mistakes that you happen to make, that creates a buffer. That way, the company can go down in flames and you won't necessarily go down in flames personally. Wonderful. LLC, it's the least complicated of all of them and you can turn it into an S Corp or a C Corp later if you want to, but you don't have to. Start with an LLC, they're also cheap. You can go down to a small business advisor, pay $50, so that's what it was up in Ohio at least. I think it might be a little cheaper here in Kentucky actually. Um, go there, $50, LLC, sign the paperwork, draft it up. Now what? Get a lawyer and have them look over that paperwork and make them your permanent lawyer. They will charge you by the hour and it will hurt your wallet. It'll be like, oh no, it's throbbing and pulsating and bleeding my wallet. No, 
Ah, it caught on fire. That's fine. A good lawyer is important. A good lawyer is worth it. Have your lawyer look over any paperwork that comes in that basically requires a signature. You need contracts. Just because you're working with your friends doesn't mean you don't need contracts. Have him look over your contract, please. You'll see an accountant because all of a sudden you're in LLC, you need to pay taxes. Maybe for the first three years, you are literally paying zero dollars in taxes. Hopefully you'll be getting some of the money back of the things you spent if you keep your receipts. So it'll be like, oh, cool, I bought this important desk for my studio. Neat. That's deductible. I get that money back. Well, most of the money back. Cool. Get an accountant, please. Most accountants do free consulting. Most accountants are willing to work with you if you're a small business. They make special small business lawyers and accountants. Go to a local small business incubator. Now, you're going to want other funding sources as well. Maybe try crowdfunding. Cool thing about crowdfunding is it's actually a better tool for building your community around your games than it is even for making money. But if it'll make you money, do it. Maybe talk to Louisville Makes Games, especially if you live down here. They can often help you know, people like fund their, their studios. That's wonderful. And if they can't, they can at least give you advice and they can at least point you in the direction of people who can help. There are tons of small business incubators. There are tons of like the little, um, little things that like help you with small businesses. Lots of tax credits too. Now, if you're not a nonprofit, you can't get grants. It'll all have to be loans. But that's fine. That's cool. Now, what from there? So you have your studio. Also, if you ever sign a lease on a studio, have your lawyer look at it because you have to sign a lease. You'd be surprised at the amount of reputable buildings that you might be potentially renting. You're like, oh, cool, I got a $300 closet where I can type things. It's great. It'll be completely reputable and the lease will still be illegal. It's great. It's wonderful. Oftentimes the landlords don't even know. Have your lawyer look at the lease, please. It's so weird for people to say, oh, my lawyer. No, it's just a dude I give a couple hundred dollars to every few months. It's fine. Like, it's, it's not really some sort of magical thing. Like, I have an attorney on retainer. No, it's just like, yeah, I have a small business lawyer that I happen to have a cool relationship with. And then you give him money and he looks at my paperwork so I'm not an idiot. It's great. What's after that? Maybe, just maybe, you can make games. I know, right? All of this time talking about the business stuff. But that's what this talk's all about. It's supposed to be the business stuff. So you make your games. You make your games. Then you have to do patent stuff. And then you have to do copyright stuff and trademark stuff. And whatever your lawyer do it, you don't need to think about it. You say, Mr. Lawyer person, I need to give you my patent stuff. And he's like, okay, there, give me 200 bucks. It's fine. It's cool. Now, go to these conventions. What happens if you're on company time and your car T-bones another car? What should you probably be doing? Well, same question. What happens if you have a studio and you have someone come in, maybe even an investor, trips, face, right on the floor? What happens? Well, you're going to need small business insurance. And I will tell you the single most horrifying part of, of starting my business ever. And I've, I've been in this industry for about 12 years. And uh, it, it's, it's weird because this is the scary part. So I, I'm getting my studio started up, the physical studio space. And in the lease, it says that I need a $1 million small business insurance policy. And I look at this and I nearly die. And I go and I tell my team members, I'm like, I don't think we can do it. It's a million dollars. And I, I call Allstate and they're like, well, we don't do business insurance, but we have a partner who does. And they send us off to the partner. And I said, I need a million dollar insurance policy. Tears streaming down my eyes. He's like, okay, that'll be $25 a month. What? He's like, what, what do you mean what? This is a million dollars. And yeah, you're covered for a million dollars. I don't understand the, understand the problem. And I'm like, but it's, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of money. He's like, oh no, that's the smallest policy we offer. <laughs> they want literally the bare minimum. We can give you a bigger one. We can give you a bigger policy. You know, you want like $2 million? It's fine. This is like 40 bucks. It's a whole, whole different thing. So if you, like, if you do anything with business ever, please get a small business insurance. And if you're going to this bank, write that into your business plan. Be like, I need insurance. I need a lawyer. I need an accountant. I need phone lines. I need internet. I need utilities. Please give me money. 
begging on your hands and knees, crying up to the banker, buddy, I'll take a penny, please. It's fine. Because they know you need this. Because all businesses need this. But no one will ever tell you. So that's why I'm here. Because there was so much I had to learn. So, got insurance here, business plan, blah, 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 blah. So what was it like my first few years in the industry? What can you guys expect being in this industry? Do you know what is really funny, by the way? And I actually checked my time. I have, I have plenty of time to actually be able to tell you this little aside. So I did not, I like, on the last talk I gave, on the, uh, the one first session, I did not reach this part before running 10 minutes over my time. And so I'm like, no, I'm going to speed things up next time. So, what can you expect for your first few years in the industry? I'm not going to go all like, here's 12 years, because my first three years were basically I'm running a very expensive clubhouse where I make games. So, you can really sort of start seeing like my business, like, okay, got the studio, got my people in it, got it furnished, got the business plan, done. So, what can you expect? Well... To be very, very honest, even if you started out your experience and you're like, here is my crappy prototypes and it was enough to help me get a portfolio and help me make connections and help me get some funds for my studio, your first project will probably still fail. May not fail as spectacularly as, well, I spent 16 months working on this, this game. You know, this was, this was a year and some waste of my life and no money to show for it, this first failure might be, oh, I put this game that, that took like six solid months to work on. It was really well designed, really well play tested, really well marketed. I put it on the app store and I made $150. And my payments on my loan are $400 a month. <laughs> and my studio rent is like $300 a month. Mom, can I please have some money? Um, that'll happen occasionally. Um, I was very fortunate. Uh, my fiance's family, uh, they don't really like me, but luckily her dad's a really big fan of a game I'm working on called Collapsus. Funny story about Collapsus is the fact that uh, I've been working on it since 2006, and it's a mobile puzzle game. Remember when I said your game will never be done as quickly as you think it will? Ha ha. But no, he, can, he keeps, like, every once in a while, he's like, he's like, when's it coming out on iOS? And I'm like, it's, it's complicated. It's a complicated thing. He's like, well, why is it complicated? I'm like, well, there's code porting and all this stuff. This is a $100 entry fee. He's like, I'd give you $100 right now if you get that on the iOS. I'm like, oh, okay, man, thanks, fine. He will call me up out of the blue. It'll be like 8 at night. You know, I'm sitting down. I'm drinking a nice cup of hot cocoa. And he will call me up. I'm like, oh, hi. Dad, how's it going? It's still weird to call him dad. You know, we've been engaged for 10 years, but it's whatever. Hi, dad, how's it, how's, how's it going? You want to talk to Christy? When's Collapse is coming out? <laughs> Throw the phone across the room. It's happened. It's terrifying. He's ravenous. She's seen it. Like, it's not okay. So, the first games will probably fail. But it won't be these spectacular failures. But hopefully, it brought you to a place of understanding. Hopefully, it got you to a place where you're like, okay, that's not too bad. I didn't make a lot of money on this, but I went out to these conventions. Now, obviously, going to a convention is going to be expensive. It was like $400 for that, and then travel time, and then really crappy hotel. By the way, I stayed at a lot of $30 hotels just so I can go to these $400 conventions. But you have to do it. You know, sometimes you're just like curled up in the fetal, fetal position in the corner because there are cockroaches larger than cats in your hotel room, and you don't even drive places, you just walk to the convention center, pull in your luggage, all sweaty, throw down your, uh, throw down your table cloth, and be like, play my game, please, please, and they're like, when is it out? And they'll always ask you when it is out, they're like, I don't know, stop asking. Pull off the mask, it's your father-in-law. So, <laughs> and the thing is that maybe this will help you build an audience. I can't think about all the number of times that I've gone to an event, showed a thing, and then gone to another event a few months later in a completely different state. And someone will come and be like, I played that in Indie Pop. You said it'd be out in Christmas. Almost done. I want to buy this. That's when you know you have something special. 
And you have people consistently coming up to you being like, played it before. Follow you on Twitter. We've had some conventions that we went to where it's after years of doing this, people will come up to us and say, I came to this convention for you. I came to play more collapses. I came to talk to you guys because I think you're cool. Sometimes I might be interested in the game. They just like you as people. But you're building a fan base. And that's important. Because they'll tell their friends. And maybe your stupid little puzzle game won't, won't be their friends' favorite things. Maybe it won't be their mom's favorite things. But maybe it'll be their favorite thing. Maybe not even the puzzle game. Maybe just the stories that you shared. Maybe just like... Oh, you were at our booth for like an hour past close. We're getting dinner. You want to come with us? Grab a pint. If you're old enough for that. I don't know, college is weird. I don't think you are. You one of the high school guys? Yeah, wait to get a pint. Wait to get a pint. So that's what it's going to be. And you're going to look. You're going to get in the mail. You're going to get all these bills. You're going to get these bills. We have, we have a distribution deal with Coca-Cola in our studio. And like every month they send us crates of Monster for like a hundred bucks. And we have a nice little mini fridge and stuff. And I will look at this bill and I'm like, it's only a hundred dollars and I still wince. Because I'm like, I had to travel to Boston. Ugh. Throw it down, cry a little bit, it's fine. Because you'll eventually get there. Or you won't. And that's the thing, if you're willing to stick in it. If you're willing to say, I refuse to go back to Taco Bell no matter what. And I have friends and family and fans. I have a community of people who are willing to help me make this dream a reality. Who wants to see my creativity thrive. That's when it's important. That's when it's important to stay. Because you're not just letting yourself down when your dream dies. You're letting everyone who ever rooted for you down. And you can't do that. Sometimes you have to give them the towel. And they will not begrudge you that. They will say, yeah, it's fine. Go work at Taco Bell. Go work... You work at the law firm down the street, it's fine. They will be sad for you, not for themselves. But you gotta stay in there. Because it's your dream. And because you know they were good for you. And because you know that what you're doing is worth it. And that's hard in the indie industry. Because there's a million of us. And the really weird thing is, we might be friends, but we are rivals. Yeah, I'm pointing right at you. Because we're both trying to get games out on the market. So we are rivals. And we are rivals. And we are rivals. She's not my rival. She works for me. So. <laughs> but all we have is our community. And hopefully we're making niche enough products where we can be friends. <laughs> and that's cool. That's a cool thing about the indie scene. But you're also competing with the AAAs. And you're also competing with the random uh, Korean MMOs out there. <laughs> And you're also competing with movies and music and anything else that would buy someone else's time. Do they want to sit down and pay $5 to play your game or would they rather go see Guardians of the Galaxy for the third time? Everyone's your competitor. So you have to treat them like that. But you have to be realistic about it. Don't get paranoid. Make friends. Come to conventions. Share stories. Collaborate with each other. Share ideas. Maybe you have a game that you really like, and you're like, cool, this is great, but I know I cannot make this game. I know my team can't make this game. And you talk to a friend about it, say, dude, you should make this game. Make that game. And they make the game, and it's a huge success. It's wonderful. Share in that. Retweet their stuff. Support their Kickstarter. Tell everyone. Maybe it's not even your idea. Maybe you just see something cool that they're doing. Retweet that. Support them. Give money to their patron. Even if it's only five bucks, they're super appreciative. Okay, cool. You made friends. You made enemies. You've made money. Less debt. You've made less debt. How do you contact the press? You've done all this marketing. How do you contact the press? Well, you're going to need a press kit. Luckily, there's a little tool out there. Literally, it's called Press Kit. It's made by Vlambeer. Uh, I believe it was Vlambeer. Yes. So, guys, good. I'm, I, you're my fact checker right now. I'm watching you. So, Press Kit is wonderful. It's a wonderful tool. In, interestingly enough, it's actually built into IndieDB now and SlideDB, that whole database thing for indie games. Build a Press Kit. Lots of images. 
Contact your local newspaper, especially if you're in a place that doesn't have a lot of indie games. Contact your local newspaper. I've been in the newspaper like six times for my team just because I'm like, we won an award. Let's print it. Come down and take a picture of us. It's great. This is a star for content. Contact podcasts, small podcasts, and say, I would like to do an interview because I like your work and I think you're cool. I may not be much of anything, but I would like to be there with you. Build friends with them. Just, just work with them. Give out review copies to people, smaller people. And then when you're doing a big, big thing, go to Kotaku with your big story. Catchy headline, don't be pushy, make it brief, explain why it's special, give them your press kit, and just wish that they do it. Go into TV. Call your local news station. I've been on Fox. It's cool. It's terrifying. They had no time for what I was selling, but they treated me like they did. And they did like a, they did the report, like, here's the game, claps, it's wonderful, great, awards, go play it. It was like a minute, and they were super excited, and then afterwards they did like a live, like a live Snapchat thing, and like, oh, this is the creative collapse, you should go play this game and everything. And immediately got a deluge of emails being like, wins it out! Ah, crap, I forgot that part. <laughs> they always forget wins it out. It's cool, it's cool, it's wonderful. Gotta do the press. Because if you don't do the press, what do you got? What do you do if you have bad press? Well, just don't quote them in your press kit. That's all you can do. You know? Point people to better reviews, I guess? Maybe? Learn from them. Because the press isn't a bunch of meanies who are ripping on indie games. Most people genuinely say, small company, small team, cool game, could have been better, 7 out of 10. Got to learn from that. Got to look at their critique. and Got to say, oh, crap. Sometimes you'll look and say, that's not how you play the game, though. They played it wrong. Well, that's a problem with conveyance. Conveyance is an important part of design, where you have to say, well, I should have taught this better. Be a better teacher when you make your games. Your games need to teach people when you make them. And not just like, here's a bunch of text. Through intuitive design. Learn from that. Go as multi-platform as you can. Talk to people. Include accessibility options. Maybe some colorblind modes. Make your game as widely reachable as possible. And throw as many languages as possible. Get some volunteer translators. There are tons of them online. They just want to see your game in different languages. Make as big a pie as you can and feed everyone. Cast the widest net that you possibly can. And don't look back. Once you get it, read the press. Make a better game next time. That's what you have to do. Grow. Maybe one day you'll be selling t shirts. That'd be cool. Contact a local printing company. Say, we're tiny, print us t shirts, please. Here, here's money. It's not all the money, but take pity on us. Get t shirts printed. Maybe by that time you'll have people who want to buy them. Supplement your income that way. Maybe take some contract work. Don't take so much contract work that it smothers you to death in its weight. Take some contract work. You know, do some apps on the side. As long as you still have enough time for your team to make the games you want to make, do it. That's the important part, though. Never lose sight of the dream. Keep it pure and move forward. And that's it. That's it. That's the simplest thing I can tell you. Move forward and do not stop for anything or anyone. Because you can't. What are you going to do? Work at Taco Bell again? By the way, I have nothing against Taco Bell. I did not work at Taco Bell. It's just my go-to example. So, just, yeah, Taco Bell. It's whatever. Hashtag sponsor, not sponsor. So, 